Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. I'll be speaking for the next couple weeks on rest, um, hoping to help our summer, hoping to help our souls, uh, hoping to bring us into a spacious place where we can enjoy God's goodness together. Uh, this is the journey that I'm on personally, and I'm just inviting you along for the ride. So this isn't rest for your weary soul, because I'm rested, and I know how to do this, and um, and now I'm just giving you from, you know, from the great reserve I've got. This is rest for our weary souls. Rest for my weary soul. I'm just bringing you in to the journey that I'm uh, on. And I'm reminded this morning because this is Pentecost Sunday, a Sunday where we celebrate the Holy Spirit coming upon the church. That's what this Sunday uh, is. And when we think about that, we often think of the difference that the Holy Spirit made for these guys and and, uh, and what happened on that day as people were added to the church. But, you know, I, I was really thinking about Peter, who preaches on Pentecost Sunday an epic sermon. I mean, an epic sermon, a sermon that we're still talking about to this day. To this day, we're still unpacking what Peter shared on that day. This is just weeks after his epic fail. Just weeks after his epic fail, the Lord raises him up to give, deliver, and preach an epic sermon. And it's not because of anything that Peter's done to kind of reestablish himself, but it's the Spirit's work in his life. So as I stand up, I stand up as someone who's failed in these areas. I know very little about the easy yoke that Jesus offers. I know very little about his light burden. I'm not standing up to preach epic sermons. I'm standing up to say I failed in epic ways and the Lord's leading me into something new. Um, So again, I'm coming from a place trusting that the Holy Spirit's going to be speaking to you, that He's going to be imparting things to us and leading us on a journey together um, as as a group. So we'll start again with Jesus' invitation to the exhausted in Matthew 11. And I'll read it from the message, which is uh, a paraphrase of Scripture by Eugene Peterson. I read it from here um, just because I I feel like this version um, helps us hear things for the first time. Listen to this invitation to the exhausted. Abruptly, Jesus broke into prayer. Thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. You've concealed your ways from... The, the sophisticated and the know-it-alls, but spelled them out clearly to ordinary people. Yes, Father, that's the way you like to work. Jesus resumed talking to the people, but now tenderly, the Father has given me all these things to do and say. This is a unique father-son operation coming out of father and son intimacies and knowledge. No one knows the Son the way the Father does, nor the Father the way the Son does, but I'm not keeping it to myself. I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone who will listen. Are you tired? Are you worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me. Come to me. Not not here's a five-hour energy. Come to me. You need rest, look no further. Get away with me. Not get away to Avila Beach, but get away with me. You'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. The question I've been asking for months uh, now is how can we have an easy yoke when we don't have an easy life? 
I think I understand what an easy yoke is and feels like when I have an easy life, but when things get difficult, my life feels heavy. And Jesus never promised an easy life, but he did promise an easy yoke. So I've just been asking the question, when my life is difficult, when things aren't easy, when in fact I'm uneasy, how do I have this? Because I don't see Jesus as having an easy life. Yet it appears he walked in an easy yoke. The weight of the world is on his shoulders. And yet he seems to be in this easy yoke. And I want that. And I'm interested in the things that keep me from that. Because this is such a beautiful invitation that I find myself asking the question, why don't I take him up on this? Why does this elude me? Why do I know nothing of this? How do I have the easy yoke when I don't? have an easy life? That's the question I've been asking. And as a way of review, I just want to bring these things before you guys again, that there are obstacles that keep us from the easy life. And there are some connections that I'm seeing in my own life, that when I walk in these things, these things, I seem to be walking in an easy yoke. And the first thing is that it appears to me that the grateful get an easy yoke and the critical are uneasy. That when we walk in gratefulness, we seem to get something of Jesus' easy yoke. So the easy yoke is a call to a grateful life. Jesus abruptly just breaks into prayer here. And he says, oh, I thank you, God, that you've revealed these things. And then you kept these things from some. But I trust you. I thank you. I look to you. The context of this passage is that Jesus is facing rejection from his own. He's facing hostility. And this can be for us a really difficult time to be grateful when the people that are supposed to be getting it don't get it. How many have someone next, maybe not sitting right next to you? (laughs) Don't answer this. Don't, Don't take the bait. Don't do this. You'll pay for it. But that's a frustrating place to be when the people who should get it, why don't you get it, aren't getting it. And then the people who are least likely to get it seem all their game. And you're like, this is so frustrating to watch. This is the scenario that Jesus is in. He's pronouncing woes. Woe to this city. You missed it. Woe to this city. You missed it. And then in the middle of it, I praise you, God. What? I mean, that's a frustrating place to be, yet Jesus remains in this place of gratitude, and I think because of it got the easy yoke. The second thing I'll say is that the ones who are okay with being okay seem to get the easy yoke. And those who want to be extraordinary separate themselves, perform, stand out, be above the rest, they seem to get uneasy. Jesus is saying here that the know-it-alls, the sophisticated are missing it. The slick are missing it and the kids are getting it. The ones who are okay with just being mediocre, ordinary people are getting the easy yoke. And those who are trying to be extraordinary end up uneasy. Listen to this quote. I have so many regrets, and I have none. I wish I hadn't done a lot of things, but on the other hand, if I hadn't, I wouldn't be here. But then again, nobody works the way I work. I have an iron will. And all of my will has always been to conquer some horrible feeling of inadequacy. I'm always struggling with that fear. I push past one spell of it and discover myself as a special human being. And then I get to another stage and think I'm mediocre and uninteresting. And I find a way to get myself out of that again and again. My drive in life is from this horrible fear of being mediocre. And that's always pushing me, pushing me. Because even though I've become somebody, I still have to prove that somebody. My struggle has never ended, and it probably never will. That's Madonna. With incredible insight and emotional intelligence. It's just really hard to accept our acceptance. We want to have control. We want this to be about our performance and the people who seem to be okay with being okay and can accept that they're accepted seem to walk in an easy yoke. Those with something to prove seem to get uneasy. At least 
This is what I'm discovering. A surrendered life will get you an easy yoke and ownership will get you uneasy. If it's your yoke, your field, your work, your harvest, your plan, if it's yours, ownership will get you in an uneasy yoke, but surrender will get you in the easy yoke. It's your work. It's your plan. I've been saying that and praying that over the church when I feel gripped by anxiety. This is your church, Jesus. You're the head of this church. You know and love these people. This is not up to me. I'm partnering with you. These are the prayers that I'm learning to pray. It's not my family, not my life. My life is yours. What are you going to do with it? <laughs> do something fast. <laughs> surrendered life. There's something to the surrendered life in getting an easy yoke. Unbelief concerning the nature and character of God will land you in an uneasy yoke. There's some connection between thinking rightly about who God is and the easy yoke. He says here, learn from me. I'm gentle, lowly in heart. That when we uh, understand who he is, uh, not just in creed or things we've learned to recite, but when we really believe who he is, we end up in an easy yoke. And when we're in unbelief and we believe that he's a hard man, you're going to find yourself with a hard work in front of you and a hard yoke to carry. Simply put, we say this over and over again, but the God you see is the Christian you'll be. Isaiah 62, just, just as I was reflecting on this, I mean, what a passage. Isaiah 62, um, it's a proclamation over Israel, but one that we've been grafted into. You'll be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand. A royal diadem in the hand of your God. No longer will they call you deserted or name your land desolate. For the Lord will take delight in you and your land will be married. As a young man marries a young woman, so will your builder marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. What? There's no way. I mean, look at you. Look at us. <laughs> I mean, so aware of where, you know, we don't quite stack up. So aware that we're not enough. So aware, as Mark said, of our need. And here we have this picture of a God rejoicing over you. Rejoicing over us this morning. You have that in mind. And I'm telling you, the yoke, the work gets easier. The further you get away from this reality, the heavier the load gets. What you think about God and that you see Him rightly is of tremendous importance for us to walk in the easy yoke. I think it's why Jesus had it. A real rest... The real rest that Jesus wants to offer me is often to just uh, feels unattainable because of a deep uh, discontent in me. We feel restless. We long as human beings, we long as human beings to be complete. To be complete. And then as a result of being complete, to be secure. I long for that. And so often, I don't know why, I feel incomplete. Anybody there? Like there's something missing. I don't even know what it is. There's just something wrong with these cookies. <laughs> They're flat. You know, like there's something wrong. There's a deep desire in me to be complete. And there's a deep desire in us to be secure. And so often, I find myself feeling incomplete and feeling, therefore, insecure. We're restless. And then it gives, uh, it gives way to thinking like this. Like, if I only had that, then I would be complete. And if I was complete, then, then I would be secure. And we spend our days, like, discontent, knowing that something's off, but not quite knowing what to do. And, of course, 
the anthem for this quest, the quest of all human beings, is I believe in the kingdom come, then all the colors will bleed into one. Yeah, bleed into one. But yeah, I'm still running. And you broke the bonds. And you loosened the chains. You carried the cross of my shame. All of my shame. You know I believe it. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. There is this nagging sense in us that we don't have what we need to be complete. Can you relate to this cry? And that cry, that desire lands on all sorts of things and produces a real drive in us. This sort of discontent produces a drivenness. We're ambitious, we're searching, we're striving. If then thinking begins to dominate, if I had this, then I'd have this. If I only had this, if I could just, this is the type of, of, of thinking that this discontent gives way to, and we're driven by an insecurity. We don't like being unstable, and what we want is to be stable, and so we're driven by our insecurity to seek stability, to, ste- to seek being complete. There is a, a drivenness in us that's the result of a fear of going unnoticed and a fear of being insignificant. What is Madonna looking for? What does she really desire that she doesn't have? What is it that's driving us? There is this discontent that leads to us being driven, but like, what is the deep down desire? And I think really simply put, all of us long, 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 to know that we're okay. Long to be seen, to be known, and to be loved. It's not enough just to be loved. I want to be known and be loved. If you love me and don't know me, it doesn't count because you don't know me. But what I want is to be seen. I want to be known and then loved. I I want to be watched and I want to be praised. I want to be uh, exposed and then not rejected. I want to know that I'm okay. I want to know that I matter. I want to know that I'm valued. I want to know that I'm loved. And some of you are hearing this and you're like, dude, it's not that simple. This is silly. Those are all cheesy things. Like that Saturday Night Live character, Stuart Smalley, who looks in the mirror, is it? What does he say? I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me, you know? This is so cheesy, Travis. That's so silly. That's not what Madonna's after. (laughs) If you think this is silly or you think this is cheesy, watch what happens to a life that goes without this. Absolute carnage as you move from one thing to the next, looking to get what seems to always elude you. And you move from one thing to the next thing to the next thing, and there is a wake of destruction that follows the life that's never been blessed. If you think that's a cheesy thing that your grandma says, again, watch what happens to the life that goes without it. This is what we want. This is what we're longing for. And how many have felt like there's just no amount of attaboys that can meet this need? We still haven't found what we're looking for. There's no amount of girls. There's no amount of pats on the back that can meet this need. There's still this deep desire to be seen and loved, to be known. We see this showing up in the life of Jacob. This sort of drivenness this uh, strife, this discontent. You know uh, Jacob, right? Of the famous group, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Just connect them to that. It's Daryl Hall of Hall and Oates. 
Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's one of the fathers of the faith. And what's interesting about his life, you can read about it in Genesis 28 to 32, but what's interesting about his life is that he spends his whole life wrestling with insecurity that produces a drivenness and ambition in him. And it causes himself and others quite a bit of pain as he moves from one thing to the next. There's wreckage in his life. But then later in life, rather than wrestling with insecurity, he wrestles with God. And he says famously, I will not let you go until you bless me. And he walks away from this encounter with God crippled, but having been like healed of a deep desire that he has. He walks away like limping, having met God face to face, but he walks away having been healed. That's like the best way to describe the last 20 years with Jesus in my life. (laughs) Oh man, he has touched me. I will never be the same. My life has been ruined, but something's been healed. If you, if you know him, you know what I'm talking about. Crippled for life, but healed and going forward. Let me read the story to you. Uh, the same night, Jacob, he arose. He's on the run from his brother Esau. We'll get into that later. But he's on the run. And the same night he arose, he, he took his two wives his two female servants and his 11 kids and he crossed the ford to the Jabbok. He took them and he sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then he said, let me go, for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what's your name? And he said, Jacob. And then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. And then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been delivered. For those of you who want a real rest, for those of you who are wrestling and think what you need is to get away, what I want to suggest to you is that the first thing you need is to get alone and to get real. Because this is what happens for Jacob. He sends everything away. Everyone and everything that's been padding his life, he sends it across the stream and he gets alone with God and he gets real. And we won't usually go here unless circumstances force us here. What's happening, the bigger context here, is that Jacob stole his older brother's birthright His older brother is coming for him. The last thing he heard is that his older brother wanted to kill him. So he is running scared. And it's in that moment that he's able to drop everything and call on God. If you've never read the Bible, here's the story. When things are going good, people forget God. And then things start going bad. And they call on God. And things get good. And then they forget God. And things get bad. And then they call on God. And then he shows up and he delivers and he answers and things get good. And when they're good, we forget God. And when, we're, when they're bad, when circumstances push us to this place, well then we call on God and we get real, right? You've been here before. If you've walked with Jesus, you've been here before. Where it's like, okay, no more pretending. No more lying. No more padding my life with the things around it. Those things aren't cutting it, God. I'm going to get alone with you. I'm going to wrestle with you. And I'm going to get real. Brendan Manning, who he's taught the world a lot about getting real. Brendan Manning, has got, he's taught the world a lot about getting real. 
you've never read one of his books, I would recommend that. He's taught the world a lot about getting honest and getting grace. And, and I love this quote. He says, when I get honest, I admit that I'm a bundle of paradoxes. I believe and I doubt. I hope and I get discouraged. I love and I hate. I feel bad about feeling good. I feel guilty about not feeling guilty. I'm trusting and suspicious. I'm honest and I still play games. Aristotle said I'm a rational animal. I say I'm an angel with an incredible capacity for beer. <laughs> While on sabbatical uh, January, February, and March, I got alone, and then things got real. And about six weeks into the sabbatical, I felt like I was really wrestling and what I was wrestling with, I just felt a little bit tormented, like if I was doing uh, one thing, I felt like I should be doing something else. And if I was doing that, I felt like I should be doing another thing. Like if I was reading a book, I felt like I should be playing with, with the kids. If I was playing with the kids, I felt like I should be reading a book. And if I was here, I felt like I should be there. And if I was there, then I felt like I should be here. And I was like, am I doing it? Am I doing what a sabbatical is supposed to do? And then I would see you people who love me so much, and they're like, do you feel rested? I was like, no, but yes, I have to say that. <laughs> but the pressure is getting to me, like rest, rest, rest. I got to go to sleep. I got to go to sleep. Got to go to sleep. And then it's like staring at the ceiling, you know? There's quite a bit of pressure uh, mounting that my wife would attest to. And uh, the only way, I, uh, or the words I would choose to describe what happened during that time is that I felt that waves of worthlessness would wash over me. I just felt worthless. It wasn't that I wasn't doing enough on my sabbatical. It's that I had this deep sense that I wasn't enough. I felt worthless. And what was really interesting is that when those waves would wash over me, because it wasn't all the time, but when one of those waves would wash over me, my go-to was to sit down and make a list so I pulled out pen and pad, and I'm like, I got to do this, and I got to do this, and I got to do this. And most of these things were pretty out of touch with reality, you know. Read the whole Bible by Sunday, you know, just, just something to do uh, so that I could feel better about myself. I needed the approval that comes from achieving something, having checked something off my list. So I just furiously make these lists, you know. And what was really cool is that I had eyes to see and recognize what I was doing. And was kind of like, hey, wait, what's going on here? Exactly what is motivating me? What's driving me? Where's this ambition coming from? Because I feel a bit like Madonna. There's a deep fear of my inadequacy and that I'm mediocre. And I want to be able to hold these things up and say, look, what I've uh, done with my day. And usually, usually I have the shield of my schedule to defend me against waves of worthlessness. So I've got this like shield, you know, and when this wave of worthlessness washes over me, I'm like, that's not true. I have 36 unread text messages. I am wanted. I am needed by someone. And they're texting me right now. I do think the little red bubble on my phone says I have 1,300 unread emails, which drives a lot of the people around me mad. Everyone's groaning. We'll pray for you at the end that you get free. So I've got this shield of like my schedule. No, that's not true. I'm wanted. I'm needed. And on sabbatical, I was out without the shield of schedule, of busy. And so these waves of worthlessness were just crashing over me, you know, and I'm just getting knocked back and disoriented. And it took me a little while, but it was like, I'm going to begin to fight with the shield of faith. So rather than making this list and checking it off and getting the approval that comes from what I achieve, I'm going to stand in faith shielded by faith and say, I'm loved no matter what. I'm loved no matter what. No, it doesn't, this, what, what I get done, what I do, what I'm able to check off isn't going to affect the way that he feels about me. In my sweatpants, whether I get out of these sweatpants or not, I'm loved today. And I had to stand with that shield because I so often fight with my schedule. 
I was like, he loves me. He's for me. He knows me. And he loves me as I am, not as I should be. And he wants me as I am, not as I, I should be. Sweatpants and Crocs and all. He wants me. And I'm fighting, but it feels foreign. Because Christianity is the only religion in the world where our justification comes before our sanctification. That means you belong before you become. And it's foreign to us because this world we live in is that you need to become in order to belong. And so it's sanctification before justification in this world and in other religions. But we're trying to get our head around this gospel, this good news, this good idea that we belong before we become. And I'm just fighting there in the shield of faith as these waves wash over me. <laughs> I am a somebody, not because of my schedule, but I am a somebody because the supreme somebody with authority has called me from my mother's womb, knows me, and loves me. And again, I can preach all this stuff. I can say all this stuff. On a Tuesday, having done nothing, with no leads, no way out, it's forced to fight with the shield. And I would encourage you, if you need a real rest, I'd get alone and I'd get real because there's a drivenness inside of you that should be explored. The second thing I'll show you is that Jacob wrestles with uh, God. Right? We just read that together. He wrestles with God himself. And uh, this isn't like Jacob has one like dark night of the soul here. It's not like Jacob had a pretty sweet life. Then Esau, you know, there comes some pressure. And so Jacob has like one dark night of the soul where he really wrestles with God. This guy's had one dark life. He's been wrestling since he came out of the womb. He's been, he's been struggling, striving, and wrestling from day one. He would have totally resonated with that Madonna quote. He would have totally been a U2 fan because he's a Christian. You can't be a Christian without being a U2 fan. It's a joke. I'm joking. <laughs> hey, this guy has been massively driven by insecurity his whole life. And this is cool for us because we've struggled with insecurity our whole lives. And this guy is one of the fathers of the faith. He's a twin. He has an older brother. He's the second born son of Isaac who comes out clinging to his brother's heel. And the, his whole life, he lives with the pain of knowing he's his father's second favorite son. That he is unloved and unwanted. And if you've experienced favoritism in a family, it's an incredibly painful thing. But he lives with that insecurity, longing to hear his father's blessing, but knowing that he's unloved, knowing that he's unwanted. His father loves Esau, and it deeply wounded Jacob. Genesis 28 says that, 28, 27, the boys grew up, and Esau, he became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country. I'd love to be described as that. Yeah. Travis, you know, he's just a real man of the open country. I mean, that... I mean, we want to be this guy. We want to be around this guy. A man of the open country. <laughs> Jacob, however, he was content to stay at home among the tents. One translation I said, he, it was like he was a tent dweller, you know. A mama's boy. His mom loves him. His dad can't hack him. His name, the name he was given from birth, rather than his father pronouncing a blessing over his life, his father looked on him with contempt, named him liar, deceiver, is what the name Jacob means. And then he lives into that pronouncement over his life. He lives into that verdict over his life. Anybody ever had like a verdict pronounced over your life and then you actually just lived into it? 
well, if everyone thinks I'm this, then I might as well be this. If I'm already going to have to pay for this, then I might as well actually do this. So he just lives into this name. And he becomes a liar and he becomes a deceiver. He resorts to desperate measures and he poses as his brother Esau in order to gain his birthright and to hear his father pronounce a blessing over him. So he dresses up as Esau, poses as Esau so that he can hear his blind, dying father pronounce a blessing over him. This is such a sad story. He's so desperate. I think the saddest thing about this story is that literally he's going to be found out. I mean, there's no getting away with this type of identity theft. Esau is just going to show up and be like, wait, what happened? I was just in the open country doing what I do. What the little tent dweller do? Oh, he, he posed as you and pretended and he was phony just to hear the father pronounce a blessing over him, just to hear a father affirm him. He's going to be found out, but he's willing to risk it just for a couple days of feeling loved, a couple days of feeling affirmed. He'll take whatever he can get. And we think, oh, that's funny, that old Bible story. No, no, no. You'll fake. You'll phony in order to get the affirmation you need. You'll pretend because you so long to have people approve and speak life over you. We do this. It's not just that Jacob did that old old Jacob in the Bible times. We've moved on since then. No way. Some of you gals have given yourselves to men who have used you and mistreated you. And you know they're not the guy for you. But you can't leave that relationship because for a half an hour, for an hour, for a day, you feel loved and wanted. And it's worth it. Even if the gig is going to be up. Even if in the end it doesn't satisfy. Even in the end if it's under false pretense. You want so badly to feel loved and wanted that we are willing to give ourselves to all kinds of things. In every heart, right, there's a desire to be seen and then wanted. Not just wanted and then seen and then unwanted, but actually seen and then wanted. To be known and to be loved. To be watched and to be praised. And we think that's all silly, but you were made in the image of a God who's being seen and praised. And we have this desire in us to be seen, to be watched, and then to be praised. And we want to be exposed and then not rejected. That's the deepest desire we have. Jacob's willing to resort to any measure in order to get it. So Jacob flees for his life because he gets found out. Again, you can read the whole story in Genesis 28 to 32, but he gets found out. It feels like his life, as you read it, it's just sad because he's always trying to get up And then get away. Like to get one up. And then get away. And he's running. He's striving. So he leaves his family of origin and he starts his own family. What's really wild about this story is all the things that he hated about his family of origin he reproduces in his own family. Favoritism destroyed him. He has a deep wound because his father played favorites. And then he enters his relationship with his wife and then his wives playing favorites. And it destroys his family. His first wife is Leah. He didn't want Leah. She seems kind. She's a baby-making machine. But what he really wants is Rachel. If I could just have Rachel, then then I would be satisfied. No, 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 it's not this wife, it's the next wife. And then he gets Rachel, which is the wife he wanted, but turns out she's barren. So Rachel hates Leah because Leah's a baby-making machine and has what she wants. And then Leah hates Rachel because Rachel has what Leah wants, which is to be loved and wanted. And so there's all kinds of dysfunction in his family 
as he moves forward. And then he moves on. He goes from family of origin to the family he's going to build and the romance he's going to have. And then he starts a business and from the ground up does really well. And he's really actually successful. This guy's really hardworking. It's the one quality that he's got up to this point. He's a really hardworking dude and he does well for himself. So well that when Esau comes for him, he tries to send half of what he owns out to appease his brother. But he does really well. Yet he finds himself still discontent, still driven, still in need of a blessing that eludes him. Still in need of something more. <laughs> so he looks to his family of origin and he receives rejection. Some of you know this. You know what this feels like. And then he looks to the family he's going to build. And there's all kinds of drama and he ends up doing some of the same things, the things that he hated, the things that he swore he'd never do. He plays favorites. He divides his family. And then he looks to success. He, he starts his own business. He does well for himself, right? And now his brother's coming for him. This brother who said he was going to kill him is coming for him. And he sends all of it away. And he gets alone to wrestle with God. And I want you to notice three things about his wrestling. I want you to notice his guts. The guts of Jacob. The fight inside this guy. I want you to notice his grip. And I want you to notice his gain. His guts. He wrestles all night. All night. All night. Morning breaks. And God says, I need a break. And he says, heck no. I'm not letting you go till you bless me. This guy is done. He's done going from one thing to the next. He recognizes that this man is the source of what he needs. And he's saying, I will not let you go until you bless me. I'm coming hard after you. All night. Some of you are prepared to press in like this. Because you're so sick of the carnage that's come from pursuing other things. Listen, I wrestled once in high school. I was in journalism, and uh, I told the journalism teacher, I'm going to try out for every sport, and then I'm going to write about it. Uh, you know, the challenges I faced. And the first sport I tried was wrestling, because I knew D Coach Sear, Dan Sear. And I knew some of the wrestlers. And I was like, I'm going out for wrestling. I hope Dan Sear doesn't make me wear a singlet. I really don't want to wear a singlet. I don't know what else to say except for to say that that was the longest three minutes of my life. I was like, this can't possibly be three minutes. I have been being thrashed for much longer than three minutes. It felt like an eternity. I wrestled a guy named Kenny. I still remember it. He had a flat top. He was headed straight to the military out of high school. The whole wrestling team gathered around, and I think he was really kind to me. He thrashed me for three minutes. And if you've been, if you've done that for three minutes, you know everything you've caught is going out on the mat. And it's the long, all night long he strives with God. I'm not letting go. I'm going to give it everything I've got. And there has to be in us that type of fight when we find the one our heart longs for. No way, man. What do you think of me? What do you think of me? I'm sick of being governed by what other people think of me. What do you think of me? I'm not going anywhere until you speak to me, man, because I'm causing tons of trouble. Yeah. I'm looking for love in all the wrong places, and you need to speak to me now. I was listening to Noel give his testimony at the man morning, and Noel was in a season of wrestling wrestling with what he does uh, as a career. Anyone ever wrestled with what they do? I can't believe I'm doing this. I don't. I'm a pastor. I don't ever think about that. But he's like really wrestling. And, and I loved it because he tells this story where he comes home and he tells Megan, his wife, probably the same thing he's told Megan over and over again. I don't know what I'm doing and I don't know what God's called me to, you know. And I just love this because when he told the story, he was like, Megan just stopped and looked at him and said, you need to give God no rest until he speaks to you. And I was like, oh, my bad. 
Like, that's the kind of fight we're talking about here. It's the kind of fight that we see modeled in the Scriptures. No, I'm not going anywhere until you speak to me, man. And some of you are there. You can feel as I'm talking, faith is rising for this type of fight. I can't keep working for a blessing that eludes me, God. You have to touch my life. And I applaud that. I think wrestling is a sign of spiritual vitality. Look at his grip. I'll not let you go until you've blessed me. I would like you just to consider for a second what you would have to loosen your grip on in order to grab hold of God. What is it that you're holding right now that would keep you from grabbing hold of Him? What is it that you're holding that you're squeezing, demanding that it give you what you need? You have a white knuckle grip on it and you think it's going to produce something that will never produce. What might you have to let go of in order to say, I'm taking hold of you? I'm taking hold of you, God. And I love this because Jacob doesn't get before God like us and say, well, I like won't let go of my hurt. I won't let go of my hurt. My dad didn't love me. I was second, man. Things just got crazy. <laughs> I won't let go of my hurt. Some of us won't let go of our hurt. You hold it. You've got a grip on it thinking it's going to give you what you need. And we won't let go of it. He doesn't come before God and say, I won't let go of my ambition. I won't let go of my success. I won't let go of my hurts. I won't let go of my business. I built this from the ground up and I won't let go of my business. I won't, if you're expecting me, God, to let go of my second wife, I won't let go of my second wife. I love that one. He doesn't say that. He comes before God and he's like, I won't let go of you. I won't let go of you. And I will drop everything else I'm holding on to in order to grab hold of you. You're the source of the blessing I desire. You're the capital F Father. And I need to hear from you. Would you affirm my life? I'm not letting go until you've blessed me. Look at his gain. Look at his gain. I mean... This is a guy who feared being a nobody, and we're talking about him today. His name, when he began the game, was liar and deceiver. His name became, as a result of wrestling with God, the name of a nation. (laughs) He is in the genealogy of the king of all kings. This guy who was insecure, feared he'd be a nobody, has become a somebody because he wrestled with the supreme somebody with all authority and prevailed. Look at his gain. I love it. He wrestled with God and he lived to talk about it. Those are the people that I want to hang out with. I love getting around the people who are wrestling with God and like living to talk about it. That's what he had. I wrestled Kenny and I still talk about it, you know, and everyone's like, oh, that's kind of cool. He came face to face with God and he didn't die and he wrestled him and he prevailed. There's a fight in this guy. So much strife. This guy's so wound up. And I love the way that God sat him down. I want to invite you to the table this morning. And as you come to the table, I want you to consider a few things. You know, we come to this table, we remember Jesus, His body broken, His blood shed for us. We do this in remembrance of Him. Uh, But I want you to particularly consider three things. Just that you would consider Jesus as our Esau. Consider Jesus as our Esau. Jesus is the older brother for us who gave up his birthright. He gave up his birthright so that liars could be blessed. So that deceivers, you and me, could inherit an everlasting kingdom. Unreal. Jacob hid in Esau's clothes, and we are hidden in the son God loves. We're hidden. We're clothed 
in the righteousness of Christ. Jesus is the better Esau for us. He lost the blessing so that we could gain it. What an older brother we have in Jesus. And I know sometimes I've heard this, and you don't end up thinking like God really loves you because it's like, no, God really loves Jesus, and you just tag along. You get all the perks of that. You know, it's like God sees Jesus at the door, and he's like, Jesus, so good to see you. Hey, who's with you? Oh, that's Travis. Huh? I don't know him, but I love you so much that I'll let him in. That's how we hear that, that we're hidden in the sun God loves. He doesn't love us. He doesn't like us. He loves Jesus. And we just get kind of thrown in and kind of like a, a bundle kind of deal. But that's not the truth. Consider Jesus as our Jacob. Our Jacob. Jesus is a better Jacob. Jesus wrestled with God and prevailed. Jesus didn't just suffer an injury. He suffered death. Jesus went through a dark night of the soul. Jesus let go of everything and He prayed, Your kingdom come, Your will be done. He gave up everything so He could take hold of you. So that He could grab tightly to you. Consider Jesus as the better Jacob for us. And then consider Jesus as the masked man who wrestles with Jacob. One touch from this wrestler and Jacob is crippled for life. Our God holds back His power and He humbly wrestles with us. He holds back. That's what we read about in Philippians 2, that we have a God that holds back His power. He could touch you and destroy you. And He holds back His power to humbly engage us, to lower Himself, to wrestle face to face with us. The way I humbly wrestle with my kids is what God's inviting you to do when He invites you to wrestle with Him. We're going to open up the table. Danny's going to lead us in a worship song. Here's the other thing that's going to happen is there's going to be a ministry up team up front and they're ready to pray. Hey, please don't leave today having just let me pick a royal scab. You don't talk about father wounds. You don't talk about ambition and drivenness. You don't talk about family drama. You don't talk about looking for love in all the wrong places without it stirring things up for us, for me. You don't talk about this deep sense of worthlessness without people touching some things. Please don't leave without getting prayer. If you've never been blessed, you've never heard a father affirm you, let someone be an advocate of the father and pronounce blessing over your life. That God loves you like as you are. Wants you. If you've, never, if you've never really touched this reality that He formed you in your mother's womb, that you've felt unloved from day one, you've felt rejection from day one, and then you've gone from thing to thing hoping that that's going to meet that need and it just caused more damage. Love to pray for you. Please don't sit this out. There's no one here who's too old to receive a Father's blessing. There's no one here who's too successful. We're not going to sit there and go, oh, I thought that guy ran like a Fortune 500 company. That's funny. That's not what's going to happen here. There's no one who's going to go, oh, he should have known that by now. Look, there's a legitimate desire in you, a longing that's gone unmet. We'd love to pray for you. So would you stand with me? Can the ministry team come forward? And I would say even those who are known in this house and have faith to be the ministry team this morning, love that. I'm going to pray, come to the table, come receive prayer. <laughs> Is it true, Lord? Is it true? Do you have the rest that we need? Have you made us for yourself? And will our hearts be restless until they find their rest in you? Is that true? Because we've been to church. We've tried this stuff before and still, Lord, we're longing. 
would you come in a really personal way and give people what they need? Would you put in us faith to contend for the blessing that comes from God and meets the deep needs that we have? Amen. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantbicelia.com. Until next time. Bye.